and welcome to Mosaic at Six. Welcome to 2022 and Woo welcome to Pastor Amanda. Yeah. Um, really excited. Did you have a, I know, 2022. Did you like, what did you think when you were a kid and you thought, well, it's like when you thought 2022, did you ever think about 2020 or no. the year 2000? No. The year or? 2000, yeah, I was excited for that. It were was you? all the millennium bug. Yeah, the Do you millennium. remember that? Oh yeah, definitely. And like midnight struck on that night and nothing happened. And I was right. Like, yeah, it was a really big deal. Yeah. Honestly. No mom. bug. Yeah, right. And yeah. my mom, she had more canned goods than anyone <laughs> should have. I don't know if she was prepared for the people that were gonna get stuck here or what she thought how she was gonna deliver those canned goods, but it was a big deal. Yeah, has she still yeah. got some because they would oh. have been useful for now. Okay, so that's so funny, right? <laughs> so now it's tw twenty two <laughs> years later. But when we when she moved house from there to a different state, we had to go through all those canned goods. <laughs> I mean, there were so many of them, Sam, it was ridiculous. But when I think about like 2022, like do you, did you guys ever watch the Jetsons? Was that a thing here? Not it was for like, me, anyone okay. else? I don't Jetsons? know, the Jetsons. No. No. So the Jetsons were this like old school cartoon that talked about what the world was gonna be like. And so, you know, flying, it had like flying cars and, all types of mechanical things. And some of the stuff's like for real now, like it's for real. So it's sort of like, wow, I'm living in a Jetson movement and I didn't even know it, but oh, there you go. I've it's yet a bit like to Back to the out. Future. Yeah, exactly, it's exactly some, like that. We haven't that. got most of those things though, have we? No, no. And then what's it, Simpsons as well. They apparently okay. predict everything. Now that's what is so weird to me. They have said that they've predicted so many things. So if people are Simpson watchers, I mean, who knows? Like you might know the whole world story by the end that of the might series. Be the prophetic that we'll be talking about I a bit know, today. I know, we're going to if we're taking it off the Simpsons, <laughs> the we're Simpsons in real trouble. Is prophetic, apparently. Um, <laughs> we're, we're you had a great ones. Christmas and New Year. Yeah, I did. Yeah. How about yourself? Did yeah, you? Yeah, did really you stay good, around you. or did you go away? So we were away here for Christmas and then we went away with Elisa's family for kind of New Year time over to Lincoln. Oh, I so, like Lincoln. And you were it's in a York, really right? beautiful city. Yeah, we went to York and then up to the Northern Dales. Very nice. So yeah, it was really nice, which I love York, and, but it was slammed. I could was not it? believe how many people were in York. I was like, why did you all want to come to the same time I wanted to come? They but just it was, to shop. I think they did. Yeah, because yeah. there's so much shopping there, but I, I drug my kids. So my kids <laughs> were like, we want to go to the Viking Museum, which I was for because I really enjoy the Viking history. But it was kind of the time frames were either the Viking Museum or York Minster, right? And mom went out. I bought the tickets for York Minster. Oh, well, yeah. Right. The, and my kids were like, we're going to a cathedral <laughs> instead of going to the Viking Museum. But they endured. They were happy. But That's we had good. a great time. Yeah, it was still lovely. I was, I enjoyed it. But they came, they went and sat on the seat after they saw everything. <laughs> like, how many stained glass windows, mom, can we look at? And I'm like, guys, right over here on the left hand side. And they were not into it at all. You they should were go over with Lisa. It. She'd love it. Would she, she love reads it? Every word I, of anything. I, and enjoy I, that. I would sit. Once I've finished, I've looked at the architecture right. and then I'm done. I'm a bit like, yeah, that, that's enough for I me. think you need to know, you know, that might be like a friend group question. When people have friend groups, like what yeah. type of historical sightseer are you? So that we all know where everybody's yeah. at when we want to go see something. Oh, Elisa will be there for the whole day, <laughs> without a doubt. She loves it. Yeah, I loved it too. But yeah, we had a nice holiday. Good. Yeah, we did. So we're here, we're 2022, we're back. We're back with a bang. Yeah, we are. Um, and we're going to be talking about what you spoke about this morning. Cool. Which was incredible. Thanks. Um, it was a really great morning. So again, you can still catch up on YouTube as of tomorrow. I think that gets uploaded that tomorrow. Right. So make sure you get back onto that. But for this evening, we're just going to be digging in a bit about that. And we're talking about, you're going to have to say the word because I am <laughs> terrible with trying. It's all right, ecclesia. Ecclesia, there we are. Well done. Um, and we're going to be talking a bit more about what you spoke about this morning. So can you give us like a two minute synopsis, which is difficult, but yeah, about what yeah. you spoke so about? So I wanted to take on the subject matter of the Greek word ecclesia, which means the assembly. And it is really about the word that we use in the New Testament for church. And so I wanted to take on an idea of why does God have a church? What's the purpose of it? Why do we do this thing called church? Is it really about buildings? Is it really about this type of event? I mean, what is it really all about? And so that's why I chose to spend time digging into why does God have a mission for us and what is that mission? What is the ministry of what God really wanted us to bring out as a people, as his assembly? What is our motivation behind it? And really, what's the mentality we're supposed to carry in it? Um, because I think those components really matter 
to our ability to be effective, if you don't know why you were created or you don't know why you exist, then it's fairly certain that you will not live up to your potential. And I think a lot of people attend church and they go, I know this is a thing I'm supposed to do. It's something my kid, my parents did or my grandparents did or my great grandparents did, but I have no clue how it really works in my life. And so that's why I kind of took all that subject matter today. So yeah, so I left it in the big Greek word because I think it's fun to say, yeah. Ecclesia. Ecclesia. Yeah. Gonna, that will stick with me forever now. Ecclesia. Yeah, it's there now. Ecclesia. Yeah, it's Ecclesia. Fantastic. So you spoke on four points um, yeah, to did. do with this, um, and you just mentioned a few there. So you had, um, where are we? The motivation, the ministry, the mentality, and the mission. Yeah. Um, and what I want to touch on mostly today, because of the time that we have, um, is towards the end of what you were saying, not to discount what you were saying at the start. Sure, um, yeah. But I think people should definitely go back and kind of recap on those. But I really wanted to hone in on probably the two, the two things towards the end that you were saying about we need to learn to be prophetic, and then we spoke about a bit about fasting. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to kind of jump in on those a little bit. And I think what you said about um, being prophetic was... Um, very very incredible to hear that you can learn to be prophetic because i think a lot of the time you grow up in church or you're coming into church and you have people that are prophetic like people will be like oh, so and so is prophetic yeah yeah um, but i think a lot of the time people can kind of fail to realize that everyone can be prophetic yeah absolutely um, and it's a gift that god can give to you it's, and if you're listening to god then you can be prophetic right it? like what would you what would you say to someone that is hearing the word prophetic for the first time, how would you explain it to someone? Right, so first I would say don't get scared, don't get weirded out. Um, really, it, it's such a biblical thing that you're talking about when you say to learn to be prophetic because Paul is, right, he writes to the Corinthians, right, and a lot of people don't know about the Corinthians, but the Corinthians were like really gung-ho. They absolutely loved everything spiritual. They tried to make everything super spiritual. So if they, if they greeted you, they wouldn't have greeted you like we are right now. We wouldn't have talked about where we did for Christmas. It would have been like, oh, holy, mighty man, <laughs> Sam, Samuel from the biblical view. Like this is the way they were because they were so excited about what it meant to just be a Christian that they kind of overemphasized everything. And so when Paul writes them, he tells them, look, guys, you've got gifts. You've got things that God's given you that nobody else has given you. But the best thing you can learn to do is learn how to prophesy to yourself learn how to speak to your own future. So for me, what I would say to someone, because we use this word prophesy, but what it really means is learn how to speak to your future about what God sees in your future. And you say, well, what does God see in my future? Well, you could start by just knowing what the Bible says about what God says about your future. Sometimes it's, it is just biblical understanding, just reading words like he's for you, not against you. That's a biblical scripture. That is a prophetic word over your life. It, it continually reminds you when you're feeling like he's not for you, he is for you. So I would describe prophetically thinking and speaking as your ability to read scripture and apply it to your life over and over and over again. And eventually those scriptures and that word, you begin to speak to yourself and you begin to make pathways in, this, in the realm of your life into new places over the things you're saying. Uh, your words carry power. I mean, the book of Proverbs says that the death and life are in the power of the tongue. Both reside inside of you, and we're God-like whether you know it or not. That's the thing. You've been created like God whether you know it or not. So whatever you speak, you are speaking into something. Speak to your children. Tell me about a person who's not 25 years old, and they've had a family member that talked down to them all of their life and how it didn't affect them. Yeah. Right? Because words carry power, and they do over your own life too. Think about how often you talk to yourself and you have to tell yourself, don't believe that. Right? I mean, like, doubt your doubts, right? It's the same idea. Prophetic things is learning how to talk to yourself about the way God sees you and about what God has for you. And eventually, as you practice that, you learn how to do it even with new things that God is saying. That's incredible, yeah. I think um, we, we before, well, many years ago, we used to have something called SYA, which was Students and Young Adults, and okay. we, we did a course in um, the prophetic and it nice. was by a guy called Dwayne White. And oh, his, yeah, I know Dwayne yeah, well. Um, and his wife, which I can't... Chris. Yes. Her name's Chris, yeah. There you go. Um, and, and we went through a whole thing, and Jason, I think, was involved in that as well. And we, we spent probably four or five weeks going right. through the course that they put together. 
question of how to become yeah. more prophetic and towards yourself and to other people. But kind of the most over, overriding part of all of that for me was that if you're spending time with God, you're reading his word and you're really kind of putting him in the center of your life and you're, you're listening, then he will speak. Yeah, um, God's not silent. Yeah. And I think, so again, so much of the time people think that they need someone else to prophesy over them. But the reality is, if you're listening to God, then he's always talking. And as long as you're listening. Yeah, um, I, I find that I've never met a human that doesn't want to know about their future. Yeah. Ever. I've never met a human, whether you know God, don't know God, that you don't want to know that you have, that your future is set. That you, if somebody said, I can tell you something about your future, that they wouldn't go, tell me. Right. I mean, think about all the people that go and pay money to have somebody yeah. talk to them in that kind of a way. So it is exactly like you said. It doesn't have to be mystical. It's just the reality that we're made to care about where we're going in life. We're made to care about what God is doing or what we feel. And so when we learn how to listen to God, he is talking about that because he yeah. knows that we've been made that way. He's not denying us from those things. And I think people, they make God sometimes so much that it's something he's not. I mean, God isn't like, okay, now if you do step one, two, three, four, and five, you might listen and hear. That's not really the Lord. He's just like, hey, if you'll just stop talking a little bit in this prayer time, I've got a few things I could say too. Yeah. 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 Um, and I don't know if it, this is something you do, um, but you spoke a little bit about words over life and stuff like that. I know of a lot of people, and I've done it myself, where um, you prayerfully choose a word for the year that you're going yeah. into. Um, and the years that I've done that, and I'm yet to get one this year, um, has made a real impact on how I pursue my year because I've spoken that about the future of how that's going to go. So a couple of years ago, um, my word was um, learning. Mm. And, and in that time, I, until COVID hit, unfortunately, I'd lined up a year of people that I looked up to in certain areas, whether it was in ministry whether it was in family yeah, life really or it was good. in business and I was meeting people and trying to learn from right. them and this again kind of touches back on something you said this morning about multi-generational like yeah. preparing for the future that way and I was looking in my life personally um, to to grow as a person then I knew I needed people that had already walked that path and were further ahead than me um, is that something you would encourage people to do is is take a word for the year or not even just a year for a couple of years for three years four years where they're striving towards something um for their future by choosing something like that yeah definitely i mean i've always tried to do my best to let god speak to me about something like that as well i haven't always had one distinct word but i've always had some sense of what god was doing over the last probably five or ten years i have honed it to where i pretty much have a word for my year and it does make a difference to how you pursue your year. Yeah. And it also, <clears throat> sometimes people say, well, I don't have a word. Like you said, I haven't gotten one yet. Sometimes you then go, okay, is this an extension of a word I have had? Like I didn't get everything out of that season that I could get. Some of you probably could even right now in the chat, tell us your word. Cause it's, yeah. I think sometimes it's encouraging to other people to hear what other people are hearing or what, you know, say, well, I don't have a specific word, but I have a verse or whatever. For me, I always feel like whatever it is God is trying to say to me is to help me hone. It is to help me create banks on my river so that I'm, I'm putting the force in the right place, right? So it's so funny because I, I sent a friend recently, like a word I had for them when I was praying for them. And I it was a pastor's friend of mine. And I said, I feel like God is, and then it was another friend here in the church. I said, I feel like God is, making you like a river so that you can carry heavy things in ways that you've never carried them before because rivers can handle weight yeah. that you can't handle on your own shoulders right so you have to learn how to get into the banks of the river so sometimes words like that they just give you an indication of where to spend your energy like you said i got around people that i respected um, like for me this year one of my one of the words that is over like i feel for me is to reconcile the gaps. I feel like God has said, this is a year of reconciliation. Well, that's a funny word because I don't feel unreconciled in probably the way people would think. They may think like relationships, yeah. things like that. But I don't think that's what God was trying to say to me. God's trying to say to me out of Matthew 13, 52, which is where the Bible says that a wise teacher pulls from their treasure, both old and new. God's wanting me to reconcile what is old with new. 
he's instructing me to do that. He's instructing me how to pull things that are old and pull things that are new and make them work together. And so, of course, when you get a word, that puts you on a course to say, I need to pay attention to this. I need to be careful that I'm paying attention. So yeah, I would encourage all of you, every person, if you don't have a word, you should get a sense of what God's yeah. doing. At least a sense of your season. Um, don't wear winter clothes if you're in a summer season. You know, if it's a season to shred something, stop taking around all the winter stuff, right? Like yeah. it's the same idea. Like get a sense of your season so you know what you're doing. Practically, how would you suggest people go about doing that, like finding a word or getting that sense. Yeah, right. So for me, um, you know, everybody's process may be different. My process starts about in October. So I would, I normally, I actually ask God, like, God, what are you saying for this next year? And what do I need to be paying attention to? And then it sort of unfolds normally out of my reading and my prayer time. I just begin to sense things and I begin to sense, okay, well, what what is God? Or sometimes I even sense it in my own family and I'll bounce off of a few ideas. Like, yeah. here's what I'm thinking. Here's what, what are you thinking? What is, where are you at? And those types of things begin to generate ideas. So I would say a few different ways. One, I would say your own personal prayer time should at least be a start and it should certainly be the finish line. But also being around godly people that just are thinking like you think, who can give you some raw feedback. Like when you're like, hey, here's why I'm struggling. Because listen, you may not say it on this particular thing, but every person says, well, I don't have a word. There's a reason you don't. It might be like, I'm afraid to like, I don't know. Have I given God enough time this year? Have I, I mean, it's like all kinds yeah. of reasons, right? We all have them. And then we all have to just admit them to somebody that we're close to and say, okay, this is why I'm struggling with this. Help me. Yeah. Help me with this. And then a good friend will do that. They'll look at you and go, hey, you know, I'm going to pull you up. I'm going to pull you up <laughs> out of the dirt and tell you this is what God is saying. And, and I've had friends do that for me. Like last year, my word was, one of them was tension. I refused to tell anyone that word because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want this word. This is a weird word. Why would I want this word for 2021? But then my dad died January 19th. Um, you could not have made anything more tense in that moment yeah. than those months and the months that we've had since then. So it was, like God unpacked that word. It wasn't all unfolded in January, but I got around a friend in January before my dad died. And I said, I've got this word. Will you pray with me about it? Like it's a weird word. And God just sort of started to unpack it and through our relationship and things. And then it made sense. I mean, 19 days later. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. So I would suggest people get around good people yeah. that can help them. Definitely. And I think that's the same with anything in, in life, in your like, Christian life, like having good people good people around yeah um like most people have probably heard one of us say it at mosaic at six but a good friend of ours would always say show me your friends and i'll show you your future yeah totally um, it's good and it, it's that always rings true in anything and i think particularly in a time when you're you're trying to walk forward and move forward then you need those good people around you um to cheer you on and to also knock you back if you think if they think that you're going a bit yeah, I always go into my year saying, who do I need to meet this year? Yeah. So one of my strategies is, is that I don't know everybody I'm supposed to know. That's really important to me. And it was important to my dad. So funny that we're talking about this because um, my dad, he kept a journal. And when he, after he passed, uh, all of us kind of were looking through the journal and it was the beginning of the year. So my dad wrote a lot of thoughts at the beginning of his year and yeah. he kind of taught us to do that. But in his journal was a list of five people's names that he wanted to introduce himself to that year of people he wanted to meet and wanted to build a relationship with. And some of them would have been prominent and a couple of them would have been people that I would have never thought would have been on that list. Yeah. But he did that because he wanted to keep himself in a constant growth mode. So I do think your friendships are a great indicator of where you're going. And I think your pursuit of new friendships is a great indicator. That's really good. Yeah. It's, a, it's the ones that you say, hold on, I didn't know you 10 years ago, but I know I need you now. Yeah, yeah. that's really good, that's great advice. Um, so moving, moving forward from that, um, we spoke, or you spoke, I didn't speak this morning. You but spoke. it was good that you, <laughs> yeah, if you want I to. I felt like I was speaking, you know, <laughs> you I was in that it. involved. Were you in it? Um, you went on to say that, um, obviously off the back of everything that you'd already spoken about, um, the assembly and, and stuff like that, that we're going to go as a church yeah. um, into a time of corporate fasting um, right. on the 17th of January for one week. Yes. Um, and for anyone that hasn't seen this morning yet um, and is going to catch up on it, I'd love if you could speak a little bit about that and then your thought process behind that, why we fast um, 
and kind of what, what you look to achieve by fasting in a way, if you could give people an idea of what that would look like. Yeah, so I think fasting is, you know, a lot of people would say it's an old school word and the people that would do it today in some religions would do it for all the wrong reasons. They do it because they're trying to reach God or get God to do something for them. That's all the wrong criteria for fasting. Fasting isn't about getting God to do something for you. It's about aligning yourself with God's thoughts. And it does that by causing you to reduce your own personal cravings for things. So none of us like to admit this because when you become an adult, nobody likes to admit they've got <laughs> cravings, no matter what the craving is. If it's food related, if it's something that's not good for us in another way, nobody likes to admit that they have hangups that they can't deal without that Diet Coke every day or they can't do without that cup of coffee. Mm. And I know you own a coffee shop and just so you know, if you're fasting coffee, please don't take it out on Bean and Leaf. But all of these different types of things that people truly end up actually slightly addicted to where they can't live without it and they'll, they'll go without their prayer time, but they don't, want, don't necessarily go without that. Yeah. And so what fasting does is it forces your body to have to come into alignment with your spirit, man. It says that my spirit, my person that's on the inside of me, the one who really knows how to connect with God is bigger than my mind, my will, my emotion, my soul. And I'm, I'm bringing it into alignment. And the reason I do that is not just to show that it could be in alignment, but so that I can hear God fresh and I can put myself in a position that demonstrates that my craving is first and foremost what God has for me. And the reason I choose to do it at the beginning of my year first, and the reason we chose to do that at Mosaic first, is because it's related to setting apart our year so that we don't get midstream down this thing. Yeah. And then it's like, oh man, you know, God had something for me. He wrote it to tell me in January, but I would <laughs> never take the time. You're talking about taking the time to listen. It's fasting does that. Yeah. Fasting makes you listen because you have to think about not eating that food. Like you do, no matter what anybody tells you. Even if it's something you don't even really eat that often, you still think about how, man, I really miss that. And um, it's like in that moment, you, you just have that reaction that helps you understand that you really crave that more than you crave the presence of God. So for me, fasting centers us back in focus. And for me personally, it does that. It keeps my ambitions in alignment. It teaches me, that's what I said even this morning, I can be very gung-ho in the beginning of the year. Like I can, I mean, I got enough vision to last anybody's life for like a hundred <laughs> years. Like I'm like, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this, and I'm ready. I'm like ready, like who's with me? Let's go, let's go take the world. You know, little Joan of Arc over there. But I've had to learn that fasting for me personally is a pace setter. It helps me set pace, teaches me how to set pace. So I wanted our church to participate because I think first it's gonna focus us. I think it's gonna bring us into focus. And I think it, whatever happens corporately, you need to know this for those of you that are watching, whatever happens corporately always trickles to the individual. It's never the other way around. You don't just do it individually and then it ends up being corporate. Yeah. You do something corporately because then it affects the individual. Your family becomes blessed because the corporate body becomes blessed. That's the way that works. And so I think fasting is all about bringing us into a place that says we're acknowledging that the world is full of cravings. It's full of things that it's trying to give us. And we're acknowledging that we're not going to let anything above God. And we're going to take this time to demonstrate that. That's great. Yeah. And yeah. I, I like, I mean, fasting's hard, man. Yeah. Like, there's nothing easy when people are like, oh, you must just love to fast. Are you kidding? That's what <laughs> makes fasting fasting yeah. is that it's not easy. And people ask me all the time, well, what should I fast? Well, adults tend to like to make it easy on themselves. So they like to do things like, well, I'm going to fast my four pound coffee that I buy, you know, once a day in my week. Well, not, it's not that that's wrong. And it might be a place for some people to start. But if you feel that little bit of conviction that says you're not really doing enough, listen, by the way, listen. Because for me, I always try to put pressure on myself. So you know I'm allergic to sugar. Yes. So to say that I'm staying away from sugar <laughs> would be a ridiculous fasting mechanism. Yeah. Because truly, I don't eat sugar. But to say I'm not going to eat meat, I'm not gonna eat a carb, I'm not going to eat any of these types of things would be a huge sacrifice. Yeah. Dairy of some kind, it's a huge sacrifice. So those are the types of things that just help my body to continue to remember who's in control. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's great. And something you said right at the start of that um, stuck out to me that a lot of the time we can walk through life fasting on prayer. Yeah. And by switching that over, we take something else away, we fast on that, and then we come towards prayer. 
And I think that's a really good challenge for everyone watching today that if you feel as though your prayer life's not in um, a place where you want it to be, that something like fasting can really change that. Totally. And, um, by doing that, like seven days can make a massive impact on how you then follow, follow through for the rest of the months, the rest of the year, um, and moving forward. So it would be great for everyone watching that um, I believe that there's some stuff going out about fasting. That's some, right. Um, what's yeah, the word some I'm ways, looking for? materials. Yeah, that's it. Materials will be coming out where um, it can give you a kind of an action plan of how to fast, um, how to move forward in that, and then a way that you can join in corporately um, as we do this as a church. And I think it's going to be a really transformational time. It's something that, from what I believe we've never done as a church. Um, and I know of a lot of people that have in different churches and the way that it can transform, um, just even if it's your mindset into being more connected to God, I think um, it's just going to be an incredible week and we're going to see some real transformation. Absolutely. I, you know, that's, the funny <clears throat> thing is we're never commanded in scripture to fast, but when Jesus refers to prayer, he always says when you pray, right? Yeah. Pray this way. But he follows it with when you fast. So there was always an assumption yeah. by Jesus that it was part of our lifestyle. So I do think there's something that happens when we fast together. I mean, yeah. deliverance can come to our life, protection in ways, favor. Esther called the children of Israel to fast so that she had favor with the king. Favor can come. Protection against enemies can come. Wisdom can come. The book of Acts tells us that when, uh, when all of the apostles fasted, it was in the fasting time that they said, separate unto us Paul and Barnabas. So wisdom came on what was supposed to be the strategy. So I think fasting, this is going to be an amazing time for our yeah. church. Incredible. Um, we want to thank you for today. For, hey, thanks, bud. Yeah, we've loved it. Um, thank I'm you. Sure, well, I've loved it. Um, and I'm sure everyone watching has loved it. We're going to invite Jason up now. Um, to lead us yeah. in some worship. And then we're going to come back, we're going to pray, and we're going to close out. Sounds good. Perfect. Over to you, Jace. All righty, let's worship, guys.
Pastor Amanda is going to pray for us and you um, that are watching, and then we're going to be closing out. We are so glad you joined us at Mosaic at 6 today. just want you to know, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, I want to tell you God's for you. I don't want you to forget that today. I love what Jason just sang about pouring out on the Lord, not just our praise and our worship, but even the places that we just don't understand letting God take control of even the areas of our life. I'm telling you, God is doing something in your life. And I know that he is right now coming into your home, coming in through your phone, coming in through the work that you're doing, whatever, wherever you're at, that God is speaking to you. So Lord, I ask you right now that you will touch every man and every woman, that you'll touch every teenager and child that is within the realm of the reach of my voice, that you will cause your love to overshadow them. Thank you, Lord, that your peace will surround them, that your goodness will undergird them. Lord, today I just thank you that no matter what situations are being faced where there's so many unknowns, that you, God, can bring peace in the midst of a storm. So, Lord, today we thank you for peace. We thank you for a peace that is not understood by mankind, but it is understood by the heart that today you'll settle hearts, that places of anxiety will, will fall like wastelands, the places where there have been mountains of defeat, that they will once again become valleys that are passable so that men and women can find their destiny and their purpose. I thank you for courage over the next 14 days as we begin to launch into new territory of fasting and prayer, that you'll give men and women courage to say yes to you in new ways that you'll give them ears to hear and that you will speak to them. Lord, today I thank you that you're not a silent God, but you're constantly talking to us. And Lord, I'm asking you to unplug ears, open eyes, so that men and women all over the land can hear your voice. Lord, today we bless those that are listening. We bless what they're doing and we ask you that you will gird them up and let them feel the very comfort of your spirit. And Lord, we do it in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you again, Pastor Amanda, for joining us this evening. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jason and the tech team. And of course, we'll be back again this time next week. Mosaic, live at six. We'll see you next time online. Woohoo! Taking it on. I don't know. I just felt like we should do something. <laughs>